Okay. okay. Uh, so, guys, uh, my name is Carlos. I'm work on soft, um, I work on file systems teams at Red Hat on Rick Wheeler's team. And uh, I have spent, I guess, the past few weeks working on some performance analysis regarding device mapper, theme provision, and target. And uh, that's wha what I'm going to talk about today. And uh, just for a matter of context, I added some stuff regarding XFS technology and device mapper, so just a, as a matter of context. And so XFS, for if anybody, so somebody doesn't know it here, is a B3-based file system, uh, which if it's not the first, it was one of the first file systems who you started to use extents and delayed allocation. And it, it also has a good feature about, um, about Stripe alignment when you're using a, a RAID system you can set up the, files, the XFS to make aligned IOs to the RAID device. It's mostly used for RAID 5 and RAID 6 IOs to avoid read mode file writes. Um, thankfully to the allocation groups, there's uh, the way XFS splits data between the device, uh, into, uh, along the, the whole device. It has a really nice improved parallelism into the file system, and also it works with journaling. So one of the things that really matter when we are talking about performance uh, XFS over the thing is the allocation policies XFS really has. So depends on how you set up your file system, you can change the allocation algorithm XFS used to allocate data along the disk. And it will really matter when you are using XFS over a uh, thing provided on a device because the way actually the M thing is going to allocate data blocks from the disk. So in the next few slides, we'll take a deeper look over it. Um, I highlighted the Stripe alignment because this is one of the f most important features XFS has that will really matter when we will be talking about the team provisioning. And uh, for those who doesn't know, the Stripe alignment stuff over XFS was created to avoid read and modify write cycles. Um, in some circumstances, it might increase the amount of six into the disks. So I did a, a couple of tests using device ma using XFS over RAID 0 and RAID 5, and most of times when you use uh, technologies like RAID 0, uh, the amount of six created, uh, increased by this doing alignment stripes, you actually uh, uh, decrease the performance of the system. So alignment, alignment is just a matter of, you, you, stripe alignment you will be using mostly on RAID 5 and RAID 6 device. Uh, five, five stream allocator we won't be talking about today, but this is one of the features XFS has to lock allocation groups to a single write stream for a um, period of time. And this is not really important to our talk here now, but it's a, another great feature for XFS, mainly, I believe, with person that used to use uh, Video, video streaming or some, some stuff like that. Uh, we have also uh, extend hints we won't be talking about today. Uh, Real-time device and I know 64 options and amount of free disk space is one of the stuff into XFS which will change the allocation policy algorithm. So uh, for those, uh, for if somebody doesn't know, a device mapper is just a framework to construct a new block device over existing bl block device. It's managed through an IOCTL API using libdev mapper or DM setup user space application. Uh, it also is a kernel space, it's the kernel interface for all of them too. So, so then the DM thing target is a recently new target for device mapper, which implements team provisioning into a software layer. 
Um, it basically allows many virtual devices to be stored on the, on the same data volume. Um, one of the things the device mappers developers done was decided to store the metadata from into a separate device from data. So you can just uh, use that to use, I, I don't know, things like solid state drives or more resilient devices like RAID, RAID 1 or RAID 10 to improve metadata resilience. Uh, it also works with a smaller, with a, the same thing also works with data block size, which are the smaller IO units for a same thing device. So something like the file system block size, but over block layer. Um, it also has su support for block discards or, and trimming commands, which you get from the, from, from the user space or file system layer and pass through down to the storage layer. Uh, one of the nice things developed into the, the, the DMT target was the new way it used to do snapshots from the block device. So if you, the new way DMT is using to make snapshots, it used the copyright B3s like BTRFS does. So it allows us to reduce the amount of disk, disk usage by sharing block volumes between sharing data blocks between volumes. Um, it also has no concept of origin and snapshot device, so you can have an um, depth of snapshots. And in theory, there is, not, there is no limit between how many snapshots you can take from another snapshot. Uh, it also has a, a good improvement in, in, locking, in avoid locking contention that we had, we have on the usual device mapper snapshotting algorithm when all snapshotted devices share the same lookup table. So I add another slide about, with a single example, examples about how to set up a device mapper team providing the volume. Uh, Sorry? Yeah, yeah. I, I believe I, I was thinking about the, add some examples how to use it over LVM. LVM, LVM ha, too has already support for device mapper, team provisor device. But I, I really didn't like the LVM interface and preferred the DM setup. It's more, it's more, much more simple and I, I don't know. So uh, some use cases we can, we, that is worth to use in improvising on the same thing is, it's, I believe it's mostly into virtualization stuff like um, I, internet service providers like Amazon f offering virtualized colocation servers and file servers when, when email web server users home directories and some good stuff about where it might be useful. And uh, snapshotting is a really nice feature when you are talking about virtualization, mainly if you have too much virtual image. I, I, I usually used to have one single image and take several snapshots of the same image. Uh, secure system updates, you can just take a snapshot, just make an update, and if it fails for some reason, you just delete it, or if it's nice and you like it, just delete the original image and keep up with the snapshot as if, this, if it were the main image. And also some resilient backups, and when you don't have, when you have a really only copy, a really only snapshot, you can avoid to make a backup of really heavy writable volumes. I just had a quick question about snapshots. You said there's no concept of origin? Yeah, yeah. So when you do these backups, how are you tying these snapshots back to their origin? You actually... Is it just like a naming trick or...? Sorry, so can you speak a little bit louder? Sorry, sorry. I mean, if you have no concept of an origin of a snapshot, how do you, like, if it's a backup, how do you restore it back to its origin? Uh, actually, sure. when I, I, I'm talking about backup, I mean, you are 
doing a backup of the, of the system itself, not using the snapshot as a backup. But it, you can also use this. The, it, it doesn't have a concept of origin and uh, origin and snapshots because it uses a copyright B3, so it just a, a lot of block, uh, a lot of, how can I say that, two, same, two volumes pointing to the same data blocks. Um, once you change any kind of these blocks, the, then the, the, the copyright B3 will copy that data block to another, to another data block. So until you don't have any kind of rights to the, to the snapshot or, or the origin volume, you, you, you will only be sharing the same kind of data blocks. So maybe, maybe another way to put this is they're both actually equal copies, right? As opposed to the historic way of thinking of it is you have the source and the, the copy, you have two versions of the same thing that can both be updated, copy and write after that. Yeah, exactly. You only suffer kind of, you only need to cop, really modify, uh, have new, allocate new data blocks for the snapshots or even for the origin once you have a, a right to that specific data block. But until then, it's everything sharing the same data blocks, but with two, with, with two root, root nodes for, uh, how can I say that? Uh, two different root B3 nodes, I, I believe, uh, sharing the same, the same structure. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, conceptually they're of equivalent hierarchy after you make the snapshot. So if you were to go, if you wanted to go to, if, if you wanted to move using a different set of data because uh, at some t point in time that you snapshotted, uh, your previous setup, you would just start reading and writing yeah. from that. You wouldn't, there's no exactly. concept of going back to the exactly. yeah. some snapshot. Of course, if you add any kind of change into the snapshot, once you delete it, yeah, yeah. you, you have everything yeah. deleted indeed. So uh, most of this talk is about performance analysis and this is some performance considerations I would like to talk about the GM thing target. Uh, the overhead it will add to the, to the file system or to the iOS stack is really depends on the usage you, you are doing to actually to the, to the block device. Uh, I could note that mostly of the performance impact we have is when we do concurrent write, write, sequential writes to the, to the block device. I have two, I, I have two graphs here. Uh, it's not on the slide because the size of the the graph would be really really bad into the slides. So let me just that. Yeah. Let me just take this. Okay. Uh, so this is a uh, this is a right pattern, and uh, mainly the main important here is the is the first graph is the right pattern of ten right streams to the same file system over XFS. So XFS can nicely spread all the right streams over along the whole disk. So you don't have a specific linear I/O. You have a lot of it can allocates different spaces along the disk to make the, the right stream as most sequential, as most continuous as possible on the disk. So this is a really nice feature, XFS. I, I don't know much how the other file systems treat this kind of right streams, but this is one of the things XFS can do really well about spreading data along the whole disk using the allocation groups and making the writes as continuous as possible. Uh, Sorry? Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, I should do this kind of stuff as a user RAID 5 device with a 3 plus, on, 3 plus 1 RAID 5 device. So with 64K stripe units and a 192 stripe width. Is that what your question? So uh, this is what happens when we do the same kind of write to a, 
to a thin provisor device. So it does the whole the same ten write streams. It makes everything linear. So that's why we have a lot, much more amount of six and. Uh, it's why the performance decreases a lot when, when we are doing sequential I.O. So the whole 10 write streams is just linearized on the same, on the same disk. And let's just back to So uh, random I.O., I have a lot of graphs after these slides to, to, sh to show this kind of information, but random I.O. has a really small significant performance impact, and that's where I believe most of people will be using the M-Thing M -thing target and team provisioning. Uh, the snapshot has a really significant performance impact when you take the first snapshot, but after that, the performance is almost continuous. Um, concurrent write volume is also has a, has a really small performance impact, and I have we've been seeing some graphs about this later. Uh, some stuff about how to improve performance into the file system. Um, the data block size of the f of the files of the DMT should be aligned with the read stripe width. So in this case, I was using 192 stripe width, and that's what what I use into the data block size of the DMT target. If not, aligning you will be much more easily facing read and modify write cycles and your performance will be, can really go to hell. So. Uh, thankfully to the, uh, the minimizer size we can add to the DMT target and also uh, due to the, sec the, linear, the linearized pattern it causes into the, f into the device, ma into the block device, um, there's no really reason to align XFS over it. So most of my tests using XFS, the full stuff, mostly show it to be the most performant, to have the high performance pattern of the disk. And, uh, this is mostly because when you al try to align, uh, align the device, the file system over the, over the block device, the write patterns from the XFS change, really change and it starts to pri prioritize data alignment than data locality. Um, let me try to rephrase that. So if you are using device XFS with the full patterns, XFS will try to keep everything cl as close as possible. So, uh, file inodes, directory inodes, and data, fi um, data block files, files data block, he, XFS will always try to keep everything as close as possible on disk. So, it reduces a significant, significantly reduces the amount of SIGs into the file system. But when you use any kind of alignment, it will be you, you can be also increasing the amount of six because XFS will always try to prioritize uh, alignment rights before um, uh, um, before data locality. So there's no guarantee you will have inodes and f directory inodes near from the data blocks uh, of the files, etc. So you will be much more you will be facing much more seeks when using XFS data alignment than when using the default, the default configuration. But if you are using a RAID, RAID system, think, since it will reduce a, a lot of the amount of read modify write cycles, you can have a better performance. But actually over a linear block device pattern like the same thing, it will be only decreasing the performance of the system. Uh, the same thing target also has a, an option you can use to avoid block zeroing when allocating these kind of blocks. It's really nice, it, it, it can really improve the performance uh, as you don't need to make 
two or more writes to, the, to allocate just a single block of data. And uh, it has some algorithms to also avoid block zeroing, even if you have not set this option. But if you are doing whole, um, alloc whole uh, block size allocations, it will also be trying to avoid zeroing blocks because it, that's really not needed. But I found some bugs into this that we'll see why in next slides, actually. Uh, so uh, this l last uh, topic I got because I found some bugs into the DMT thing called that when using skip block, when not using the skip block zeroing option, uh, the sequential write performance will, you actually have a really performance, you actually had a, add a really performance penalty to the, to the sequential writes. So it, so, sorry? Uh, this option actually, every time you need to allocate a new block from the, from the thing provider device, uh, the DM thing will first zero the block before give this to the, to the above layers, like the file system. So using this option, you tell the device mapper target to, not, to, to bypass the block zeroing task be, uh, before giving the block to the above layers. It kind the only bad reason about using this, not uh, using these options, that you can expose stale data, stale data for, for, for users. Which is a problem, right? I mean, it's a potential problem. About, about the using. Uh, so when you have, for example, uh, you have you are, you are using them thing over a public provider f offering virtual machine servers. I, I guess Amazon do, does that, right? Uh, you be, uh, if you don't zero the blocks before giving to the, to the actually real users, you be given, I, how can I say that? You can be given blocks with data from another users to these new users. Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm not sure why you need to do it, because we have Ben and Ted both in the room. I, I don't think in general you can ever do a read from an unwritten block. Actually, you, if you are giving that to a virtual machine, you will have a root access to, the, to that specific block. Oh, to the device, yeah. Yes. Yeah. But with a file system on top, you don't normally let people see raw blocks that you haven't If written. you are using a file system, right? Yeah. I, I, I talked with Eric actually about this a lot because I was I was having the same kind of question, but you don't necessarily need to use a file system of that. So I, I, I don't know, actually, I, I use it to a lot of virtual machines over device mapper block devices like LVM. You can just give an LVM block device to, the, to a virtual machine, so you don't need really to have a file system over it. So this is the first graph about a performance comparison we're using de device mapper, DMT target, and uh, the file system over the physical device. So this is the, the bug I, I told you guys I found. Uh, let me just, I can't see it. Uh, if we see the, the first graph about sequential writes, the, the yellow bar shows a really, really huge performance impact when using, when the same thing is really zero in blocks. Uh, I was expecting actually a, a huge performance penalty when using the same thing, but this kind of uh, performance impact we can see is, is much more we, we were really expecting. But the question is really here is really because if you, we reduce the record size of the, of the IOs from 192, what's really the strap with it to something smaller like 64K or 32K, this, the right, the right tr throughput here comes from 50 to around 200 megabytes. So 
we, it's doing the opposite of what we really expected. We really expected that aligned record size would be much more faster than non-aligned records, uh, non-aligned record size. So this is where, this is a bug we are still investigating. So beyond that, it, when we are not using block device zeroing, uh, the performance penalty is not really huge. So given the gains we have using the MT, it, it's really a worth technology to use. And uh, sequential reads is um, it's also can't, don't, doesn't show um, huge performance impact too. And the run, random writes and reads also can show some performance gains actually using the anything target because it reduces the amount, it can reduce the amount of six when doing random IOs. So your sequential write performance. Sorry, I, I'm not listening to you very well. Okay, so let me see. Um, your sequential write performance looks to be similar to your random write performance. So the question is, when you test this, do you write um, the DM thin volume more than once, the same blocks, I, I, or is this I, I, an I really hear you very bad. Sorry. This this is actually not pre-allocated data, so it's just fresh allocated because the reason I, I believe one of the many reasons people will be using team provising is is not to pre-allocated data. So this graph actually I use just fresh data. I didn't real did it rewrite data? So I, I did some performance tests here in some of the many environments I was thinking people will, would be using that, and one of these is virtualization environments, so. The Anthony uh, workload. <laughs> so what, this is one, one kind of environment that got some data from a virtualization provider using like some four virtual machines with 300 gigabyte disks each one. And this is a kind of performance we got. Uh, we are, when we are not zeroing really blocks, we have um, not huge performance impact. But when we are really needing to zero blocks, that I believe it will be most of the case into public clouds or ISP providers we have a, a really large performance impact. But otherwise, again, against RITs, we don't have much performance impact. What's the workload for this? Uh, it's actually, uh, I assume here is just a current, how can I say that? It's not a kind of, it's, how can I say that? It's just a current uh, workload of of operating system like up software updates and things like that. It's not a, yeah, I'm not uh, simulating disks here like database or file servers. I have some file service tests later after that. But this is just a, the current operating system, basic, basic operating system IO patterns. So this is a, I, I tried to simulate a file server using a compile bench from Chris Mason that's a really good tool to, to make ha several ha have workload IOs to the file system and, okay. Um, and it also can simulate a lot of file system agent and try to identify how, how well the file system can keep director and data locality, so. This is a kind of IO pattern that I could, achieve with the compile bench. So mostly of the, 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 pat, the patterns are really, uh, uh, it's not really bad actually using the DN thing. So it might be a great feature to file servers and user workloads. So one of the things I was worried about is when we use multiple devices because we have we share the same metadata metadata device. So I did some 
performance tests using multiple volumes and multiple partitions into the same device. And this is what kind of... Uh, okay. So the, the, the performance panels that we have, it's really, really consistent between the, the several kind of IO workloads. Um, also, using not using not zero in block device can now is also having showing some better performance here. Uh, this is the right into series snapshots performance of, I was I was talking about uh, when we start to create several snapshots. The first snapshot here has the big the hugest performance package, uh, but the another one is is very really consistent. Uh, regarding writes not if you can take a look at reads and cache the read we just have the same kind of performance on both of them this is also um, I got this information also using compile bench so it is like a um, user pattern is similar So this, so this is showing once you have a snapshot of a volume, the performance goes down. Yeah, exactly. This is actually a, a lot of stacked snapshots. You can, it's a lot of snapshots from snapshots from snapshots. This is one of the features DM Thing Target provides. It's a, a, in theory, unlimited depth of snapshots. And I was really wor worried about how much performance you might lose at each depth of snapshot you get. So it showed actually a really performance penalty in the first snapshot, but actually that after that, the, the another one is just a, 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 almost the same kind of performance impact. It, it's not a, it doesn't go down to of each snapshot you take. It's all snapshots have the same performance, although it's have a lot of impact into comparing to the main volume. So if you then remove the main volume and snapshots, all the snapshots except the last one, does the performance for the last one get better, or is it still at the low level? No, it's, it's, uh, it's still the low level. You can get a more, more performance about this. You still have... So it's due to fragmentation or something like that? In the Mostly because of fragmentation, the, f the way I actually the James in target uh, allocates data because it's really a first in first out uh, dumb algorithm is it doesn't have it. any kind of intelligence where to allocate data it's just first in first out so it really fragments its data thanks The fragmentation impacts you more on rotating disk than it would on an yeah. SSD device. I didn't do any kind of tests into SSD first because uh, I really believe that most kind of performance impact we will be having into the Spino device. So there have uh, been. Is there some, uh, like, uh, Alec, you, you had a slide about uh, the Ben, just speak a little bit louder because I'm a little bit deep. You had a slide about the allocation policies in XFS. And it, are there allocation policies in uh, DM Thin that interact with that in any way? No, not no. really. Okay. That's why the one point I, I was really trying to figure out, that's a good question, actually, because XFS has all those allocation policies regarding mainly regarding allocation groups when it spreads out every uh, concurrent write streams into different places on disk. So you can have a lot of continuous data. Uh, you can avoid actually fragmenting co uh, s the same write stream. You can, uh, how can I say that? It's, it's really spreads out concurrent write streams to different parts of the disk. So you can achieve a, a good data continu a, a lot of, uh, you can have a, uh, you can have contiguous data actually for each write stream, but thankfully to the device mapper, it makes everything aligned, so you will be fragmenting everything. So every kind of good policy that XFS has, the thing just cancels it. Yeah. So, Dean, so th this is actually so the the broader context of why this 
I think this is interesting work is because when you do these abstraction layers in device mapper or, or other things, it's, it's like going back to Andy with the persistence, persistent memory talk. We can skew all the allocation policies that the file system thinks it has by remapping it underneath you. Right? You put a copy and write device on. And I'd expect a performance impact. I think it's not too bad. So it seems. seems actually yeah, actually, for yeah. I believe most use cases, like especially render IO, it's not really too bad. But after showing this, this kind of results to people like Max Nitzer and another device mapper developers, they, are, we, they started to think something about better and more intelligent allocation pattern policies to make better usage of the disk. Like uh, if you request the block 1,000, we won't try to allocate the block 0 from the disk. We will maybe be trying to allocate the block 1,000 or, or something like that. I don't know what kind of, of intelligent algorithm do you start to write, but they started to think in something like that to improve the 13 algorithm uh, allocation algorithm, actually. This just goes back again. One of the things I've, I've seen us as a community, in the kernel community, doing a lot is we don't think of the end-to-end -end use case. So like the device member team worked on this for a couple of years, didn't really do a lot of performance testing, I think, of the whole stack of applications. So it's, it's kind of important to keep that in mind, I think. And it draws out a lot of interesting work. So this is a, a random I/O pattern simulation from the same the same kind of snapshots. Uh, the the oh sorry, yeah, sorry. Um, you mentioned early on there's a separate volume for DM thin metadata. Yes. Is that on your RAID or a totally separate disk device or what? What were you using for that? The actually I use it uh, for this kind of devices. I use the uh, a loop device to store the metadata, but uh, a loop device on the same disks. Yeah, no, not on the same disks, on different disks. Different disks. On different disks, but, uh, but when I disk. when I got this kind of performance impact, mainly into this here, mainly when I got this kind of performance impact into sequential I/O, the first thing I thought was to be the uh, some bottleneck into the, the metadata volume. So I used a run disk to add the metadata volume and I got exactly the same result. So it's not something. So I, th there were no need to start using run disk for store metadata volume after I got the same result I got here. And, and the other kind of interesting thing I think is just to point out to, peop to people, the 192K is adjustable, right? So you yes. could turn it up to like, a meg or two meg. Yeah, exactly. The, the main reason uh, I, I used 192K is because it was this, the Stripe unit, Stripe with it actually from my RAID, from my RAID device. And what really surprised me is that using aligned record size, I got this poor performance. And using smaller IO units, I got better performance into the device. That's what, what we are trying to figure out where the, the bug is. And we're using a smaller, um, smaller record size over a thin provided device, not uh, using actually the skip zero in block option. We get what we really expected. So we get slower writes into the device when using skip block zeroing and better writes when using 192K. It's, it's really the opposite to what's happening into the damn thing, it's what we are working on. It was the same kind of write performance, but using random. There's a question here. Sorry, maybe something I missed earlier. Is the uh, block zeroing done at allocation time, or is it done at access time? Uh, the block zeroing option? Yeah. And are you actually writing the zeros to the disk? Exactly. Or is it just metadata? To the disk. Is it there an opportunity for maybe just storing that the block is invalid and then at the first read time you will uh, return it, zeros? It actually writes the zeros just when you request a new block. So it's just, a, it's just during allocation time. So you, you try to write something to that disk from a file system perspective, I mean. So the, the, the then thing we will allocate a new block device or a new data block to you. And before 
give the block to the above layers like the file system or anything else, he will write a bunch of zeros to avoid exposed stereo data. So again, this is the reason you would do this. You would never do this with a normal file system running on top of you because file systems like ext4 track when the extent has been written, so it'll return you zeros if it's allocated but unwritten without going to the physical disk. But if you're using raw block access, you know, if you're a virtual machine and you're an untrusted guest, you could have exposure of leaked data. So on the first read, before you do your first read, they have to write, right? But then you do a, a, a write modify read potentially, right? So you get a lot of seekiness. That's why the performance is so so crappy, I think. So and, and instead of writing zeros, um, f for reasons I don't fully understand, there are some storage devices that are actually faster to write ones to, like Sorry. specifically NAND technology. I and I don't know exactly why that is, but it's I, I know it's true. But, um, I don't know. It's something it's One to of do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should never be focusing on that. <laughs> so, just, so just to be clear, the main reason why you have to do the zeroing is because the write to the block device didn't completely cover the DM thin stripe. Uh, if you did do a full write of the megabyte or whatever your stripe size is, there would be no need to pre zero. Yeah, exactly. Uh, actually, there is uh, some kind of algorithm into the DM thing target that if you are doing a whole block data I.O., the DM thing won't be zeroing the whole block device. There is, there is no reason to do, to do that if you are writing to. That's why, uh, that's where I think mo probably the bug we, are, we found lies. So, Right. So, for example, if we were doing an image copy um, of a block device, the pre-zeroing wouldn't actually be an issue. Exactly. Right. So it's only if you're going to be doing a random write pattern uh, on the raw block. And device. also. Well, it's actually sequential, but it's not yeah. the whole write stripes, right? Being the sprites. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I mean, you know, so, some more kind of selfish motivation here is th this technology actually is really exciting if we get the performance tuning done for XFS and XT4 because it takes some of the pressure off the people who are waiting for ButterFS to be perfect. We can give you bad and declining performance just like ButterFS <laughs> with lots of active <laughs> copy and writes. Cool. Yeah. So this is a, just a conclusion slide I got talking about the the huge performance pen penalty is mostly when we are doing sequential I.O. Uh, random I.O. workloads, the performance are almost the same and sometimes even better because they reduce the amount of six reduced, thankfully, to the first in first all allocation algorithm from the DMT target. Um, bypassing the block zero on device pro while provisioning block has a significant performance boost, but it's not really feasible in all cases. Some cases we really need to zero the block de device before giving it to the above layers. And some uh, where to find more information I got. Uh, uh, the current documentation has most of the information about the DMT target and XFS.org and DM develop mainly list. And some acknowledgments I got from people who really helped me. I, I, re I really need to mention these people here, Dave Chin and Eric Sanding, some of the XFS developers. Max Nietzsche is one of the DM Team Target developers, and Rick Wheeler also helped me a lot of this. And please, if the, perf if the presentation sucked, it's my fault, not them. So please blame me, not him. Yeah, so, so again, this is more of a presentation, which is less of the plumber's thing. But I think it's interesting to take this example. So take this one application stack as one use case of this. The DM thin gives you more scalable snapshotting in general, even if you don't really care about the thin provisioning, right? But there's a trade-off between how big your record side is and how fine-grained your, your ability to do snapshots are. I, I'm actually really interested to see any kind of performance comparison using a software provider, uh, software thin provision and uh, hardware team provides on like, I don't know, Symmetrics or some yeah. huge, huge storage the system. Guys. The but I, I, I believe this is kind of hardware storage will be much more faster than this, but the price is really more expensive well, too. Well, when you do it in hardware, you're, you're actually doing a software, but you probably have hardware assist from 
basically battery backed or non volatile memory caches and things like that that can hide some of your performance hits? Yeah, I, I, I think the VEST DM thing target has a lot of. Um, it should be. It sh uh, how can I say that? Um, it has a it's, a. it's a really nice technology and really needs some kind of more work into the allocation algorithm to make this a little bit more intelligent. Um, to avoid the first thing for thousand. No, I think it's a really inter interesting enterprise class storage technology that we're giving to people on open source systems that's been around forever in the enterprise storage race phase. Also, uh, later this afternoon, we'll talk about SMR drives, you know, the ability to do this. There's some things here we could use when your device characteristics, you've already got the virtual to physical mapping hidden from the file system. If you noticed, it turned your, your write pattern access. If you go back to the C, the C graph, it turned it absolutely linear, right? Just by mistake, right? Not even trying. Right? So, um, and you can make the chunk size really big. There's some tunings you can do with or without this. So we'll have another interesting discussion later this afternoon. Raise your hands, drive guys. You're gonna hear about um, a new type of drive technology uh, that's being proposed, uh, getting our, you know, kind of the community's feedback on how usable this is, how we can help them get this thing to production at highest capacity, highest performance. Device Mapper is a great example of a technology that can help. Things you can do with a file system. Ted, raise your hand in the back so the drive guys can recognize you. And Ben's the XFS maintainer. So we have people here who can, can you know, hopefully give us some feedback on this. So one thing I'd be interested in, does this sound interesting to, I mean, I look at Anthony as Mr. Mr. QMUIO, Mr. Virtual IO. It's yet another place to do copy and write for you. You, don't, you can do QCAL 17 now. <laughs> yeah. So I think the big challenge with something like uh, Device Mapper is the fact that it's, uh, it's root only. It doesn't have an ability to delegate permissions. I mean, you could build it on top of it, I guess. But um, you know, I, I, I don't want to troll here, but I sort of always wonder what the troll? separation <laughs> between Device Mapper and a regular file system is. So uh, personally, I'd prefer to see this sort of stuff in like ButterFS. But, um, so I guess the question is, where do we stop with the, where does device mapper stop and file systems begin to the device mapper community, right? Where do you see, why not put this feature in F XFS, for instance? So, so I'll give you, I don't know, Ted, you want to poke first? I'll, I'll poke second, and then, then Ben can. So there were patches uh, to try to add snapshots into ext 4 uh, there is a NAS vendor that actually developed file system level checksums for EXD3. We explored putting them into EXD4, and ultimately what I decided was there was just simply too much complexity. It wasn't worth it. And one of the reasons why we ultimately decided to drop trying to add snapshots into EXD4 was the knowledge that DM Thin was coming along, and it was much better to do it at that layer than to try to shoehorn something like that into ext4. So, I mean, I actually did seriously consider it. We had code in hand, um, but ultimately, was we just simply didn't want the maintenance headache of trying to put in what was actually really complicated code um, that was very clever, and that's what made it very scary. You know, I'll give you my idea, right? So, so people often hold this up to the metric of, well, ZFS did this all in one. It didn't really. ZFS actually does have a well-distinguished block layer API that's, that its file system stuff's layered on top of. If you do what ButterFS did, which is a great technology, and I like ButterFS, and it's wonderful, but you have to rewrite the rate code, rewrite the snapshotting code for each file system. There's no sharing. There's no leveraging of that code base. We recreate the same bugs, same data integrity after power crash testing has to be done in specific implementations. Not a great way when we're looking at new file system technologies all the time. It's my opinion. I mean, it's, it's good to have consumable things at the block layer that file systems, or another way to put it is, just because our usability sucks with LVM or device mapper doesn't mean we should throw out the mechanism. We should fix the usability, right? right? Your root-only stuff and usability, they're real valid concerns. And this is the fundamental problem, at least for virtualization. Most people want to work with image files, right? So most users want to copy images around. They're easy to move from local storage to NFS or whatever. Um, and so they want to do snapshotting at a file level. Uh, that's the fundamental problem. Yeah. So file, file 
yeah. So like a file interface on top of device mapper would be nice. That's called XFS Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but yeah. before you do the uh, yeah. Or it's called UCAL. Yeah. UCAL, yeah. You can make a file system with one file in it and copy it all you want. And I'm not and I'm not actually kidding, right? Because with this technology it's actually scalable enough that you can make a bunch of file systems, each that are independently controlled, maintained, administered, and copy away. Any comments? Everybody want to go to lunch? Yes, sir. Rick. I would like to understand what happened in the C graph when you showed the, the XF, the pure, exactly, that one. So, and now, so you had uh, it striped over all this. But yeah, when just to uh, a matter of context, it's just uh, 10 r concurrent write streams, no, right? So this is, I understand, but what happens with, with, with the DMSIN? So the next one, so why is it only. Um, the, let, let me get this one? Yeah, exactly. it's, it fragments everything. Does what? So it fragments everything. Okay. So you are doing concurrent write streams. It, I, I don't know exactly what. Uh, it, we don't have the exactly time resolution here to talk about serialization or something like that. But the whole 10 gigabytes I, I was writing on the, the previous graphic was written here, fragmented everything. So. We can also see the amount of the amount of seeks we can spend here into the then thing due to fragmentation. So we have a lot of um, almost five thousand seeks. So Carlos, if you go back to the slide, right? The reason the ten streams allocate differently is because when you read them back, you want them to be contiguous, right? So the right the right spreads them so the reads are better, right? If that makes sense. And if you go to the DM thin slide, go forward. This is actually bad in general because now you've written contiguously, but your reads will be disk and it will be fragmented. Unless you're a SMR drive vendor. Right? <laughs> right. And that actually might, you know, this kind of stuff could be useful in some, some circumstances actually, because you, you make contiguous writes out of random writes, right? Yeah, we force you to make them contiguous. Rick, just, just following up on that Usability sucks um, thing. So how do we how do we fix that? What's a what's a forum for? Because it it's it's a lot of different layers, right? And everybody maybe that everyone individually thinks they're part of the subsystem has fine usability for what it does, right? But so we have actually as a community we've we've been talking about usability for for a good few years too. So there's something called Storage System Manager from Lukash Turner uh, SSM. I don't have the URL locked in my head, but Google SSM. Um, there's lib storage management, actually. Andy can talk about that a little bit. Actually, I'll give it to Andy. We are working on this. So I'm going to be, I'm going to be talking about this a little bit later at the, in the second session, Lightning Talks. But basically, uh, there's, there are efforts underway to, uh, to, to, to make all this easier to use. We have uh, so lib storage management is, um, it's not just a library, it's also a command line tool that allows you to, uh, uh, it's, it's really focused towards uh, uh, managing storage arrays, so remote, remote storage arrays, and um, allocating uh, block volumes and that kind of thing. So that's underway, but we also have efforts locally on improving the library support for LVM, and we have uh, both the C and Python library for manipulating not just LVM, but also the thin provisioning capabilities of LVM, which is pretty cool. So that plus the, um, the, um, the, uh, the, the, um, the LAO uh, target stuff, those two things go really well towards making, um, can be combined to something, that, uh, to a, a program called Target D, which enables you to basically treat a Linux box as a storage array you get, and it's, it's building on top of all these different pieces. It's building on top of DM thin, it's building on top of the storage target and, um, and, the, and all the RAID stuff that you can do to kind of t tie all this stuff up, put a bow on it, make it easily remotably um, administratable. So that's kind of uh, what we're looking at right now.
Which one? Sorry? Okay, but can you imagine in the slide, you know, you go to AT and T or tell the user that's my first that's what you tell the user Actually the worst part is I don't think even that's one. It's if you want to extend the pool device, you will need, really need to create a new a new device mapper table and unload this one and reload the old one. And also, this is not reboot per stain, so you need to write a kind of script or something like that to reboot this. Oh, I think we need to fix the man page. I, I send a patch next week. I've been my slides in the afternoon. I will show something else. Um, so it, say it t tells you about um, pairs, and then you need to, to specify pairs of parameters, and then it, t it asks you to, to specify the number of parameters, and then you have to, to, to specify the number of parameters two times the pairs. But it doesn't tell you in the main page, so you think, oh, I need to specify now, I need to give two, and then two would mean two pairs, but two means actually two parameters, so one pair. Uh, before I figured that out, it's, it, it went in the afternoon. So the URL is fedoraproject.org slash wiki slash features uh, storage system manager. So if you Google, that might help you find the right one. Uh, SSM is actually not a good thing to Google for because it's a short <laughs> acronym. Uh, <laughs> Very nice presentation, but uh, one of, uh, thing is missing for me. Uh, it is comparison, comparison with LVM, because a lot of things, as I saw, could be done using uh, simple LVM. It will be nice to see uh, comparison uh, the DM thing with uh, LVM, yeah. I think, in this presentation. Yeah, thanks. Uh, actually, LVM uses the device mapper linear target, and I, I, I really like some performance tests about how much performance back the linear target adds to the to the file system or, or to the block device actually i i really doubt it should be more than 50 or 10 percent and uh, honestly mainly because the, the the linear target does the whole allocation which it, it's not an on-demand allocation so yeah i, I really Proposally didn't add this kind of stuff because I really thought nobody would ask about this. Um, so I just wanted to point out. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to point out that a lot of the discussion has been around, you know, managing a Linux box like it's a NAS appliance or a, a, a storage appliance. Um, but snapshotting is still useful for desktop users. For, for users, right? Right, right. So. I just want to encourage everybody to also think about people running on a laptop or who don't necessarily want to treat their box as a, as a NAS appliance. Come on, come on, Anthony. Butterfest you can say that cloud so word again. <laughs> Butterfest or SSM, I guess, would be the would be the first answer to that. Down the road. I would say differently. The user has something. They have their, their machine and they want a copy of their machine. They don't know if it's a file or a filer or whatever. Sure. But we need to figure out how to make things meaningful to, to you know, less sophisticated power users. Copy offload. Like Tron. Like Tron should be able to do this. I'm just saying, copy offload. Copy Sorry. offload, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? So just a note, um, well, thank you, Carlos, for the presentation. Thanks. Uh,